and it is my pleasure, privilege to introduce Joe today. I asked him if I could introduce him instead of somebody else. So welcome to the Kahila North contingent members, oh, who are not members of Kahila. We're glad you came today. Uh, I think a lot of the older members, of which I am one, know Joe, uh, but many of the younger ones might not. So I'm going back in Joe's life to when I first encountered Joe, which it turned out was 50 years ago. I thought it was 30, but it turned out when I did the calculation that the 60s are no longer 30 years ago. <laughs> and uh, Joe is a world famous immunologist, and I am an immunologist. And uh, when I was a graduate student, I read papers by Joe Oppenheim, who I guess his name is Juice, okay? But anyway, then uh, fast forward to whenever we joined the Kahila, which I have no idea when that was, but it might have been in the 90s or 80s, okay. And Joe was up on the Bema. 30 years Joe and ago. Libby were up on the Bema getting an honor or something, and I thought, is that the same Joe Oppenheim who I, whose work I admire in immunology? And of course it was. So. Um, we have a long history, although he didn't know about the first 30 years of it together. <laughs> so anyway. Um, he knew me. <laughs> when, and anyway, so um, then uh, Joe, as you're going to hear today, uh, was a little child during the Second World War and um, was in hiding and wrote this beautiful memoir that I read Years here's the one here's the one that's in English he just showed me the one that's in Chinese the version of it is in Chinese yeah that's amazing somebody has translated it into Chinese but anyway the story of his his experience so today we have this um, our first high-tech uh, prep program where we're trying to bring in several of Joe's kids from all over the eastern United States. How's that? Oh no, Midwest and Midwest. And we're hoping that's going to work. And, and he's going to talk about what many of you have read about in that article that was in the Washington Post this summer <laughs> about his decision and the decisions of his kids and his grand some of his grandchildren to uh, think about seeking German citizenship. So. Um, Anyway, it's great to have everybody here and also Joe to have to hear Joe speak. Thanks. Uh, everybody's a shrimp here. <laughs> That's not kosher. Uh, not kosher. Uh, so I'm missing tennis to do this, so um, <laughs> I hope you take it easy on me and don't uh, bounce the ball back too hard. Uh, the, the, the reason we're here is because uh, uh, this article sort of encapsulated the uh, decision we made to become uh, Germans. Ich bin jetzt in Deutsch. And, uh, uh, of course, for uh, Jews, it's a rather difficult decision, and especially if you were subject to the Holocaust to persecution and lost your father at Auschwitz in the process. And uh, this article actually is quite good, and uh, written by a young lady who's the uh, religion reporter, Julie Zausmer, for The Post, and she did a wonderful job. And there's this picture of this old German Jewish guy with his young grandson. I looked at this and I said, oh my God, that's me. <laughs> and uh, the best thing about the article is the crossword puzzle is on the back. <laughs> anyway, uh, let me uh, put things in perspective a little bit. Um, so you have an idea of the context of what happened. Um, uh, my parents, uh, in 1933, were uh, working and had a small uh, business and factory in Dusseldorf, Germany, 
And my father was uh, an industrial chemist who would produce uh, waxes and polishes and uh, oils for floors and shoes. And um, he decided, because of what was going on in 1933, ooh, that tastes good. He decided in 1933, thank you, uh, to actually uh, uh, move across the border to Venlo in Holland because Hitler got into power and he he correctly diagnosed Hitler as being bad news uh, for Jews and uh, um, so he decided to emigrate and uh, uh, they uh, set up uh, my father and mother set up the business and factory in uh, Venlo Holland which is uh, right on the border of Germany and Limburg and uh, continued to serve customers in Germany and in Holland. And uh, in 1938 uh, or 37, um, my grandmother, aunt, uncle, and cousin came out and they lived in Venlo while waiting to get a visa uh, to come into the United States. And that took about uh, two years. Uh, for them to qualify under the quota. Um, and they said to my parents, you know, don't stop in Holland, it's going to be terrible, this guy is a real madman. Um, come with us to the United States. And my father said, well, he learned a new language, he set up a business in a different country, and Holland was uh, neutral in the First World War, so he uh, hoped that uh, uh, it would stay that way. Uh, unfortunately, he was wrong. And the Germans invaded in May uh, of 1940, and it took them five days to conquer Holland, uh, um, which, during which time we actually ran uh, north of uh, Limburg and Eindhoven, where we were living at the time. Uh, and hid on a farm, and then we went to Amsterdam, which was a free city uh, for the days of fighting. And after that, we went back to Eindhoven. And things were kind of quiet, but then, then not, not long afterwards, it was decreed that all Jews in Holland uh, uh, would have to wear a star, a gold star marked Yod. Yod is the Dutch for Jew and uh, had to go around with this and uh, we had a curfew there were, we couldn't go out after dark and uh, we couldn't go to school so i ended up in, um, in a, a, a jewish school which was set up to teach the jewish kids in eindhoven and uh, uh, we went to school that way without going to the proper public school and uh, uh, fortunately, uh, uh, my father identified somebody quite by accident uh, who ran a bakery and B&B uh, and &B in, in a small little village of Rosel, right on the Belgian border, about 25 miles south of Eindhoven. In, in Holland, that was a big distance, but here it's, of course, nothing. Um, and. Uh, uh, my brother and I took off our Jewish stars on December 14th, 1942. Uh, I felt very scared when I took it off because this was against the rules and the law. Uh, but uh, on the other hand, uh, we got new names. Um, my name was Jan Bladorp and uh, my brother was Case Bladorp. And we spent uh, almost two years uh, in uh, hiding. In, uh, in that little uh, town. Uh, we couldn't go to school there because uh, the monks who ran the school were very afraid uh, that if we were identified and caught that, and we were in the school that uh, they would have to pay the price. So a monk came uh, once a week uh, to teach me um, and the lessons he gave me were basically catechism. So I'm very fond of the Catholic religion. It's a beautiful religion. It promises heaven and uh, 
it smells good on Sundays. And, uh, you know, it's a, it, it really, and it has a, they have a beautiful Christmas, um, not just burnt potato latkes. And, uh, so, um, it was a, a, a very nice uh, opportunity to see other religions at work, and I've always been ambivalent about Judaism ever since. Um, Nevertheless, um, I, we came to the United States in 1946 after waiting a year and a half to get on the visa program and uh, uh, reunited with my grandma and aunts and uncles and, uh, who all spoke German. We lived in Washington Heights, which really was uh, a ghetto in, uh, in, in New York City. I mean, just like Brooklyn was a ghetto for the Eastern European Jews, and the Bronx were, were for God knows who. <laughs> uh, you know, my friend Shelley was in the Bronx. And, uh, uh, in Manhattan, Upper Manhattan, everybody spoke German, and they played a game called Scott, and they uh, yelled at each other in German. and. Uh, uh, I tried very hard to get away as much as possible from that because I wanted very much to become an American. It was, you know, an absolute necessity for me to adjust to this new culture, this new uh, way of behaving, this new um, uh, demands that uh, the United States <laughs> make, make to have you succeed, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I, in fact, rejected the whole Germanic and Jewish uh, background as much as possible. And people tell me I've even lost my Brooklyn and Bronx accent, <laughs> unlike my friend Shelley, uh, <laughs> who didn't have that need. How old anyway, are you at this time? Uh, How old are you at this time? I was uh, uh, 12 when I came to the US, and they put me back in fifth grade. and. Uh, uh, I didn't know a word of English. Um, the first day that I was there, I was hysterical when I came home because I could not understand anything that went on. And everybody lied to me that it would be all right, that I would l learn no matter what. And um, but you, so the next day I, I, I went in and I identified a little German boy who a German Jewish boy who speak, spoke a few words of German, and between my Dutch and broken German that I used to talk to my grandma, who spoke only German, uh, I learned some words. I came home very s proud that I had learned uh, words in English, and they asked me what. I said, shut up. <laughs> So that was, in fact, my introduction to English, and the teacher used that term repeatedly. <laughs> so, um, you know, so you, you have the idea that um, my early uh, years were difficult, and uh, that uh, I had very negative feelings about Germans. Uh, although I have a picture in my collection of photographs of German soldiers playing with us in 1942 when they were stationed in the factory that we had in Eindhoven. And uh, my brother was very cute. You know, he had curly hair, he didn't have big ears like I did. And uh, they hugged him and played around. And I have pictures of me in a motorcycle uh, being driven around by German soldiers and my brother being carried around and what have you, which shows that, you know, they missed their kids. And some of them were very human and that people are heterogeneous everywhere and that not all guys are necessarily bad. And uh, anyway, so um, I had mixed feelings about uh, Germans in Germany. and. Uh, when I became a scientist at the NIH, which happened because I could never finish my project, um, you know, they figured that uh, in order to give him a good chance, they really had to let him add it again and again and forever and ever. And I dug a big hole and um, made some discoveries. And actually, in the beginning, I had German postdocs. I had a number of them who became lifelong friends 
who went back to Germany and became professors and that I visit repeatedly and uh, one has just survived prostate cancer, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, they turned out to be very nice human beings that uh, I worked with very closely and uh, resembled other human beings. I could not detect a significant uh, difference uh, and say, well, these Germans are so-and-so, uh, as some people do. And some people, I guess, some particularly Jewish people, have refused to buy German products. They don't like German cars. They never say they never want to go into Germany or near Germany. Um, I've spent uh, several months uh, on a number of summers to try to understand what went on. And because I don't speak the language very well, I don't think I really was very perceptive. On the other hand, I, did, I had a nice time, and uh, they treated me very well. And uh, I really don't have any uh, currently um, negative feelings. Mostly, um, they seem OK. And uh, with that in mind, uh, a number of years ago, I think it was about three or four or two or three, uh, my daughter, Mia, uh, approached me and, and said to me, uh, uh, Dad, Esri wants to go to Europe to study or be an au pair, or, and uh, if you're a German citizen or a citizen of Europe, uh, it'll be much easier for us because um, they, then we all can get passports and uh, uh, we can get a, a much lower uh, charge for being educated in Europe instead of 20,000 euros a year it would be only 500 which is considerable difference and being Jewish I understood this immediately um, so um, uh, if my daughter is on the line can we bring her in to tell her end of it hello are you out there in Columbus, Ohio, Arlindo, Arlindo has been uh, on an emergency basis trying to connect us. Arlindo and Joanna. Hello, are you on the line? Hello, are you on the line? Okay. Yeah, yeah. okay, so let's see if there, if there was. Okay, can you speak? Yeah. Uh, Mayor, you're squeaking. <laughs> yeah, I think we might have some technical problems to get. Yeah. So we will never get you know, the other people there actually working for you. No. Yeah. No. Yeah. All right. So basically, um, Amia initiated this uh, whole question of um, becoming a European citizen, and it took me a little while, but then I eventually, after several months, uh, called up the Dutch. Embassy, and I said, I'm Joost Oppenheim. I was born in Venlo, and I have uh, my birth certificate uh, copy, etc. Can I, how do I become a Dutch citizen? And they said to me, Well, who were your parents? I said, Well, uh, Max and Laura Oppenheim. Were they Dutch citizens? I said, I don't think so. I think they were refugees and displaced persons from Germany. And he said, well, in Holland, it doesn't matter where you're born, it's who you're born to. <laughs> and uh, therefore, you're not eligible to become a Dutch citizen, and you probably have to apply to the German embassy. And I said, thank you very much. <laughs> and um, I sort of swallowed twice, and I said, I have to apply to the German embassy. That <laughs> puts a different light on it. And uh, I thought to myself, and um, 
After, again, several months of uh, debating with myself, I decided, well, what's more important in the world, grandchildren or memories? And of course, grandchildren are most important of all. And uh, so I called up the German embassy and uh, indicated the story. And they said, well, we have a website. And on the website, uh, there's an application form. And if you fill it out and bring it to us or send it to us, uh, we will check it out. And if um, you're eligible, we'll let you know. And uh, you can become a German citizen. So, of course, it's one of these horrible forms, you know, where you have to fill in all kinds of information. And I must confess, I had a lot of practice. The practice was because the claims conference uh, had contacted me and also sent me a bunch of forms. And the claims conference had contacted me and I had contacted them because the German government in, 19, in 2014 decided that all hidden children would get an award of 2,500 euros, uh, a one-time award for having gone through this. And I said to myself at that time, well, that was a very miserable time. I don't really need the money, but I think I certainly deserve at least that little bit. And so I applied and sent them information that I'd been hidden in Wurzel for a couple of years, etc., etc. And uh, uh, I got back an answer, very official sounding, that my uh, response was not adequate because they couldn't tell if I was really Jewish. And uh, so that, that, that's, that's a challenge. If you think about it, how do you prove you're Jewish? So I offered to send them a selfie naked. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, you can be a Muslim. <laughs> so they didn't respond to this at all. So I finally, I, I got very fed up, and I sent them this little book. And uh, I didn't hear for a year and a half. And then after this article came out in the post, all of a sudden I got a check. <laughs> so there's a coincidence there which is remarkable. Anyway, um, so I looked at this form, and I filled it out to the best of my ability, which was not very good because they asked me the names and birth dates and wedding dates of my parents and my grandparents. I barely knew the names of my grandparents, and I had no idea when they were born. I had no idea when they were married. But they were trying to establish whether my parents and grandparents had also been German. I mean, it, you know, it makes sense. It's very simple and clear. But you know, I had no papers whatsoever. And uh, I knew my father and mother were married, or I thought they were, uh, in Dusseldorf. Um, and uh, I filled it out to the best of my ability. And I went up to uh, the counter and met the uh, folks at the embassy and handed them my form. And I said, I apologize. I, I don't have a lot of the information. And they said, we have good records. <laughs> I said, you have what? Records. <laughs> if they have not been destroyed, we have good records, and we will find out everything. And if we can find out everything, we will let you know. And so I let her go. And about eight months later, I got a notice saying, your naturalization will occur in February of, what was it, 2015 or 16? 15. 15. 15. God, I'm an old German already. <laughs> and uh, so I, I told my family that uh, we were going to be European citizens and that the swearing-in ceremony was at such and such a time. And Monty and um, Melissa, uh, my son that 
lives in Potomac, uh, was uh, very interested for himself and his kids, and so was uh, Mia, who had initiated all this, and she uh, said she would come into town, and that when they came into town, they would apply and fill out forms uh, based on my eligibility that would also uh, make them and their children eligible to be citizens. So they all came in and they all filled out forms for a couple of hours in the morning and then we were ushered upstairs into a very nice conference room overlooking the Potomac and the German Embassy. The German Embassy is down on Reservoir Road and uh, very nice location behind bars and everything, you know, very secure. And uh, the German ambassador came and addressed us uh, during this session, and Anne uh, probably remembers it better than I do, but he, he was very um, uh, kind and indicated uh, to the six of us that were there that um, six or five uh, citizen candidates uh, that uh, they were uh, very sad about what happened in the Holocaust. They were trying to make amends that Hitler had decreed in 1935 that all Jews, German Jews, no longer were German citizens. But they had revoked and reversed this decision in 1949 and that Jews that had been German citizens could reapply or were reinstated as German citizens. And uh, so from 1949 on, they've had some Jews applying, and apparently they've had a fair number applying from Israel. Because in Israel, people like to have a second or a third passport uh, available in case of a disaster. And uh, they said there have been increasing numbers, as detailed in the article in the United States, uh, that have applied and uh, um, that uh, Germany had a policy of trying to uh, do this and uh, reinstate Jewish citizens as German uh, citizens. So it was a very nice uh, presentation and discussion and we all appreciated it very much and everybody put in their application. And that is basically the outline of the story, um, and uh, they asked me, they had recorded uh, and asked each of us to tell our stories, and I told the story basically uh, that I told here without some of the jokes, uh, <laughs> without <laughs> selfies. <laughs> um, and, uh, actually, um, uh, <clears throat> they then sent me an article that they published in their monthly newsletter uh, they were very pleased that uh, I, even despite my uh, rather bad background, uh, difficult background, was willing to uh, become a German. And uh, about a month later, I got a call uh, from the embassy asking if I would be willing to be interviewed by the Washington Post on this topic. And I said, yeah, of course, why not? Uh, life is an experiment, so uh, uh, it's just part of the uh, things we go through. And uh, met this uh, young lady who interviewed us, and then uh, she wanted to meet uh, Monty and um, uh, Matthew and uh, Amelia as well, and she couldn't meet Amelia except on the phone. Uh, but <clears throat> Matthew and, and Monty uh, happened to have dinner one evening and we invited her and she joined us and um, she didn't have her photographer with her but she took some pictures on her iPhone like all modern folks today and um, interviewed us and then came up with this uh, wonderful article and um, everybody was pretty much supportive except Matthew who felt uh, very strongly that I had been too easy on this and that uh, he felt that uh, um, it shouldn't be that simple to give Germans the credit of attracting me back uh, and that it was not warranted and justified. Um, and uh, 
so um, I had hoped that he would present his point of view today, but he figured he'd be in a bit of a minority, um, so he decided not to. Um, so in any case, um, basically, um, we should open it for a discussion, and please speak out loud, I'm deaf. So, um, given that you've become a German citizen, for your children and grandchildren, do they, quote, automatically inherit this, or do they have to go through the same uh, procedure with the forms like everybody else? Yeah, they, uh, the children and grandchildren have to fill out the form, and it, but it's easier for them because all they have to say is, our grandfather is a German citizen, number so-and-so, whatever is in this passport. And um, so actually, uh, uh, the process is um, rather simple for the family and uh, you know it's a question of providing evidence and I've talked to somebody from Poland since then who said that you know if you qualify uh, in Poland you can also regain Polish citizenship <laughs> but he said our records are not so good <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um. Many of us knew your mother, at, who was remarkable, oh, yeah. and maybe you could tell a little bit about how she got you and your brother across the land and in, into where you ended up. And also, how do you think she would feel about what you've done? Oh boy. It was a guilt trip. So, my mother um, survived in Theresienstadt, which was more of a transit camp and not so much a killing camp. She worked in the factory uh, splitting mica for the um, airplane uh, um, lights that, you know, I forget the name of. Um, the Dutch is cane wrappers, but the, I don't remember the English. But the, these are the lights used to detect airplanes at night and shoot them down. And uh, so she was very active in, in the factories there. And she stole potatoes, which was a uh, um, uh, crime punishable by death if they caught you. Uh, but it was necessary for survival, and uh, she survived uh, uh, stuff, which actually had the major problem after they were liberated by the Russians. There was a terrible uh, typhus uh, uh, epidemic in Theresienstadt and a number of the other camps, and 28,000 of the people in Theresienstadt died after they were liberated uh, from the typhus epidemic because they were malnourished and in terrible shape. Uh, you know, their food has been, had been exceedingly meager and not very, uh, they were, their host offense was terrible. And, uh, but she didn't get uh, the disease, I said, how come? She said, well, the lice didn't bite me. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so she survived, and uh, she came back in October of uh, 45, about five months after the war ended. It took her that long. It took her three weeks of train riding across Germany from Czechoslovakia to get back to Holland. Um, because everything was destroyed. I mean, they had to zigzag. And uh, she remembers meeting women who had survived a um, concentration camp who swore they would never be Jewish again, that it was a dangerous religion, and that they had decided to disappear as Jews from the uh, world. And uh, of course, we, we've seen evidence of this in, for instance, the family of the uh, uh, Secretary of State uh, under Albright, <laughs> Albright, and uh, so she came back, and we set up. Uh, she took us from the people who had been our foster parents uh, in Eindhoven, 
and uh, took us, and we lived for a year and a quarter in, in a small house in uh, Eindhoven. I uh, went back to school, I had to catch up, uh, and I still have my school books from that <laughs> time, with the grades not being so great. Um, and uh, then we finally qualified to come to the United States, uh, where I had my first meeting with a banana. <laughs> you know, I'd never seen a banana in my life. Uh, it was amazing. We got off the airplane and we were greeted by all kinds of goodies, including bananas and chocolate and stuff. Anyway, uh, so my mother, uh, actually, after a year of doing piecework in Manhattan, which was a terrible thing to have to do, ended up setting up a boarding house for uh, Jewish people that wanted to keep kosher as they were released from mental and other uh, hospital type organizations uh, to sort of be a B and B for them or a recovery place uh, till they could back get back on their own feet. And so she kept kosher and uh, took care of these people and she spent years doing that. And uh, uh, she had a very positive attitude towards life and uh, she had decided, you know, that her two boys were the ones that uh, she was going to try to nurture and help grow up. And uh, she had some proposals for marriage, but uh, she decided the men were not really interested in her boys at all, only in her and uh, she decided to stay single. And um, she came down to uh, this area around 19, um, I think 78 or 9, uh, when things became very difficult in Upper Manhattan and it was converting into um, a uh, Hispanic area. Um, and uh, she lived not far from where we live at the Wisconsin um, and uh, actually it was a very um, positive person and positive effect on many of you who met her. Um, we had one episode which is sort of important in terms of answering your question. Um, in 1965 I got a fellowship to study in England uh, but we decided to buy a car in France, a Peugeot, which was a big mistake. Uh, and uh, we drove uh, from France uh, into Germany to visit the little city where she had grown up. And uh, this was Klein Wallstadt. And uh, uh, we had some incidents there, which uh, I won't go into details, which basically uh, one, she was recognized by her schoolmates as having been one of the students that they remembered and they were delighted to see her and that she was still alive. And then we were entertained by a brother of a schoolmate at the town uh, uh, restaurant and at the end of having invited us and treated us beautifully, he gave us the bill. And she said, that's typically German, <laughs> you know, and uh, so the other thing that was typically German is wherever, whenever we went into a restaurant, uh, they didn't like our two little kids because they were American kids, you know, very noisy and uh, somewhat, uh, by German standards, terribly badly behaved. and. Um, uh, they would either move away from us or shush the kids or tell us to move away from the yes, restaurant, etc. And uh, the contrast when we moved into Holland uh, to visit uh, the family that had rescued us, uh, the people in Holland hugged the kids and enjoyed and played with them and uh, the attitude was entirely different. So my mother said, never again will I go to Germany. Uh, she, had, she had a bad impression of German behavior and uh, German attitudes in 1965, um, and uh, probably justified. Uh, you know, there are certain characteristics that people have that uh, 
maybe not too not too desirable. Um, so, how would she feel about becoming German? I think she would probably have thought it was not a good idea. <laughs> On the other hand, doing it for a great grandchild, maybe that would have justified it in her mind because she was basically very pragmatic. Beryl. Yeah, so of your family, um, Amir and um, Monty, Matthew didn't do the uh, naturalization. What about Mears? Did he do it? <clears throat> yeah, Mears is interested in doing it, but he has trouble organizing himself. He's a normal male. Uh, so it's taking him a long time to fill out the forms. But let me read you his statement about becoming German. Hold on. Oh, okay, great. I'm glad you asked. <laughs> I wrote down some thoughts about becoming a German citizen. I'm also considering it, but I'm torn. While generally very good, the post article missed some essential points central to why I would decide to become a German. Deciding to obtain German citizen cannot be about absolution or clemency to the World War II generation before the Holocaust. Not only don't we as a small group of victims and children of victims have the right to do this, no one does. German society and to some degree all societies must struggle and try to understand what leads to atrocities. If Germany had not struggled with us sincerely, then I would not consider applying for citizenship. But they have, to a degree, no other nation has struggled with their past travesties, and most nations have them. Not only has the war generation struggled, but so have their children and grandchildren who have had to ask themselves if the culture they were raised in made them likely to cooperate in atrocities. Obtaining German citizenship cannot be about disloyalty to the United States. The U.S. has been wonderful in accepting and an accepting home for our family of immigrants. I'm sure if we were required to drop U.S. citizenship, none of us would do it. I struggle with the more abstract question of not giving undivided loyalty to the U.S. Does taking a second nationality make one less loyal? If one believes in a simplistic view of loyalty, the answer must be yes. But does loyalty have to be binary, complete, or nothing? It's easy to reject the most extreme form of this nationalistic argument. My country, right or wrong, is a slogan that can lead quickly to atrocities such as the Holocaust. True loyalty is more complex, where one struggles to improve a society or societies. I know many people who have dual citizenship and do not believe they are lesser Americans. One could argue they are more loyal, having the option to live elsewhere, they chose to live here. If one is simply loyal to the place of one's birth because they have no choice, is that really true loyalty? Obtaining German citizenship certainly does make a number of statements. First, we are reclaiming something stolen by the Nazis. They wanted to rid Germany of all Jews, and I am happy to say no way to this. Second, and most importantly, it allows full access to the European Union, the right to live and work. I have no intention, intention of availing myself of this, but it's nice to have such an option. Retirement to the south of France would be great fun. <laughs> <laughs> Lastly, taking citizenship now, 70 years later, does not help the world forget. Instead, it brings attention back to the issue as demonstrated by the Post article. Consul General Holger Scherf, um, he was in charge of the embassy here, was quoted in the article as saying, the young ones don't have any negative feelings. For them, that's history, that's past. This is not generally true. I lived for a year in Germany as a postdoc from 95 to 96, and I was always somewhat uncomfortable knowing what happened right where I lived. Even more poignant, I lived in Nordheim, the city 
of probably the most detailed study of the Nazi rise to power, one I had studied at at the university. Jews often grow up seeped in the horrors of the Holocaust. That was certainly true for me and to a slightly lesser degree for my children. He also said, for us it's a very positive thing they are wanting to be German citizens. I don't think that means the Jews who have taken the citizenship have given absolution, but instead decided that for overall benefit to them and their families outweighs the anger. Also, it means that they feel this could not happen again in modern Germany. And I, I, I should add to this that German admission of Syrian refugees um, over the past couple of years has been exemplary and uh, I think uh, they behaved in a way that uh, outdoes other nations perhaps because of their feeling of guilt. So I don't know if that answers your question, Beryl. No, thank you. That's a very brilliant statement. Well, my son is a very thoughtful person, yes. unlike some of us. <laughs> <laughs> yes. pragmatic uh, phenomenon in England at the moment, post-Brexit, of a number of uh, Jewish uh, young people who are fearful of losing their EU ability to travel across borders or work in places, and that they are seeking out the, the German nationality in particular, because a lot of them came from Germany. I know... Uh, yeah, I've read that also. And of course, my granddaughter wanted to go to Scotland to go to university in Edinburgh. And with Brexit, the whole thing may have been blown up, and I may have done all this for nothing. <laughs> yeah. She can go to Ireland. Um, I want to change the subject a little bit. I attended the bar mitzvah of Joe's grandson, Noah, uh, at Brandeis Chapel. And... Uh, Joe and Ann were there, of course, and the four children and the grandchildren, and David officiated, and some of the members of the Dutch family that had hidden Joe were there. And uh, the sense I got was that, in a, in a way, that, that you had triumphed that you, <laughs> in a way, you were uh, becoming a patriarch. There you were with all of your descendants, and uh, I just felt impressed that this was a, a survival experience, and it was just so impressive to see. Well, thank you. In a Darwinian sense, I would agree with you. <laughs> and I look at the picture in the paper, I'm an Alta Jewish cocker. <laughs> Judy. Yeah, Joe, uh, I know the Germans uh, keep great records, so you had very little information about your grandparents and their marriage and place of birth. Did the Germans provide you with this information after they did their research? You know, being a stupid man, I forgot to ask. <laughs> <laughs> but I should. It's, it's, I'm sure they have good records I, and I, it's I, in their we, files. Yes, I, we have seen. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Um, uh, thank you, Joe, for a you know, heartfelt and thoughtful, uh, reflective uh, description. Uh, as I look through your book, uh, I can't help but be drawn <clears throat> to the current issues, and I'm looking for your commentary. You write, although elected by a minority of German citizens, the leader of the major party, Adolf Hitler, manipulated and intimidated his opponents and rapidly became a virtual dictator. With your reflections and history, are we close to that again? <laughs> uh -oh. He was uh, uh, very anti-Semitic, and uh, he actually, as a Hitler, as a young man, was a painter in Vienna. And he painted classical 
uh, scenes of landscapes and houses. And unlike the modern uh, intellectuals like Klimt, who um, did all kinds of uh, experimental stuff. And the Jewish community was a terrific main art patron at the time in Vienna. And they disdained uh, Hitler, and uh, he couldn't make a living as a, as a painter, although he wanted to. And uh, this was just after the First World War. And I think his, he was probably coming from an anti-Semitic family, but this imprinted on, on him and made him even more anti-Jewish in, uh, in many ways. And uh, he got his revenge, unfortunately. Um, I, I don't want to draw any parallels with what's happening today. I hope it's different. Yes? We were in Europe this summer, including a few days at least in Germany, and then other, other countries. Can't Canada. hear you. Sorry. So we were in Europe this summer, including a couple days in Germany and then some other, other countries. And the sense I had, at least from this little hopscotching around the continent, was that Germany was forced to come to terms with its past and um, what it had done, whereas many other countries, Austria among them, Hungary, were not forced to in the same way and therefore had not. So Germany, while pushed into it, had really done much more. And these other countries who were very complicit were, um, were just kind of moving on and what war, oh, that happened, forget it, in the past. And so I'm just wondering, is, is that your sense that Germany, although pushed, really has come a long way, whereas the rest of Europe maybe not so much? Uh, yeah, I appreciate your thinking on this. I, I, I have not uh, followed the same ideas, but it, it sounds like a reasonable analysis of what may be going on. Let me tell a couple of vignettes. Um, um, Mears's wife, when he was in Germany as a postdoc from 95 to 96, uh, had spoke perfect German, and um, uh, she, in fact, um, uh, was therefore able to mix with Germans and understand them and speak with them, etc. And she's, uh, we asked, I asked her when she came back, did you detect any anti-Semitism? And she said, um, yes, most certainly, and uh, the form it took was, in fact, people discussing that the Jews were really blowing up the Holocaust and uh, taking advantage of it as uh, pr practically as an industry, and that they had forgotten how much the rest of Europe had suffered and that the Germans had suffered terribly as well, and that um, therefore they were deserving of uh, some sympathy as well, and that uh, the Jews were grabbing it all as usual. <laughs> so there are anti-Semitic people everywhere, including in Germany, and if you let the uh, cover off the box, it'll come out. But Germany has been an occupied country um, since the Second World War, and so it's possible that what you're saying is true, that uh, or likely that uh, they've been forced to confront their past, and uh, they've done a pretty good job of it. Um, so the, Austria, they to, the Austrians like to tell everybody they were the first victims of, of the Nazis, <laughs> and therefore they should get more sympathy than anyone else. Yeah. <coughs> Well, we were in, uh, we were in just briefly in Germany, Austria, and a Czech Republic about a year ago, and we visited all the Jewish museums and synagogues and stuff we could, and the very interesting, the high level of security at all Jewish establishments. 
Yeah, sure. that we visit Could you a high level of security uh, at the museum, at the synagogues, the synagogue, oh yeah, the synagogue, did you go to the synagogue in Munich? It's like a bunker and uh, Can't tell you. In Budapest, in the Can't you. I'm saying that at all the Jewish uh, institutions that we visited, it, we weren't there long and we didn't go to that many, but we went to the sort of obvious Jewish institutions in Munich, in Vienna, and in Prague, and there was this high level of security, you know, just physical security. And so that, obviously, that has to do with the big Muslim population, too. But, you know, it just seemed, I don't know, un uncomfortable. Well, of course, Beryl, here, as you're driving along Wisconsin Avenue, you always see a police car near Tiffany's. Is, is, that, is that true? Well, Tiffany's is not Jewish, but the, this, this is what we consider very worthwhile protecting. <laughs> but in, in Florida, uh, there are, uh, Anne, you want to speak up? Uh, our, our synagogues had, in uh, Tampa, has had a couple of, uh, a, a, a gunshot through the sanctuary. That was a number of years ago. And then also now, CENTCOM from uh, MacDill Air Force Base comes and tells how much security all of the Jewish organizations need. So there, it's still going on here in the States. And there is a police man or woman at any time there's anyone at our synagogue. The preschool services, any time. Hey, um, I'm 29. So um, for a lot of my life, the type of anti-Semitism that you have experienced has been something of an abstraction to me. Uh, in the last year or so, I've seen it publicly and emboldened uh, in a way that I never had before. And I'm wondering if that's something that you have seen too, and if so, sort of what you make of it. What have you in seen? In this country. Uh, just a lot of, uh, if you're on social media, for example, a lot of people saying really vile things about Jews and you know, the world Jewish conspiracy and stuff like that. And, the type of sentiment that I'm not so naive to think doesn't exist, but sort of what you mentioned about how it's kind of a low-level simmer and sometimes you let the top off and then you realize it's been there all along. It's been kind of shocking to me seeing how <coughs> present it is in our country um, when I had thought we had moved past that and uh, probably it's a fringe element, so I'm just curious to know what you're talking about. I live, I, I live in a cocoon of uh, NIH research, so I don't see any of that. But uh, you, you hear about it. Uh, Joe, thank you so much. So, <coughs> what, thank you so much. <laughs> and your humor comes out as an amazing part of who you are, those of us that know you. So, I did read your book, which was remarkable, and I remember the touching stories with your brother, who was in some ways less resilient, seemed less resilient than you, or, or you were taking care of him a lot. So I guess I'm wondering, were you always this funny? Was that, <laughs> was that part of you as a kid? Was that, was that part of your secret sauce? Well, I worked on the Borscht circuit when I was a kid. <laughs> but I, I, I was the boat boy and uh, not, on the, not on the stage. <laughs> thank you also. Thank you for your, all your remarks, and especially the passage you read from your son's reflections, which was so thoughtful and, and mature and, and prompted in my mind the fact that uh, my wife Frances and I both have dual citizenship for different reasons. I'm not quite sure why I am a UK citizen. Does anybody? Can anybody? <laughs> um, my you wife sound has... like one. <laughs> 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 yeah. 
Because, does he look like one too? So we have dual citizenship. Our children have dual citizenship, which we've always protected. And our grandchildren too. They've all inherited it. And it has practical advantages. And the thoughts that you shared from your son are, are very, uh, very pertinent and very relevant. Um, the, the, very many ways in which um, dual citizenship is advantageous, and especially in this new era that we find ourselves in, a lot of people are thinking about it. We had dinner the other day with some friends who shared a, a remarkable observation. Um, that Their son is looking for Spanish citizenship. And the reason is that our friend, uh, the father, happens to be Sephardic. And there is a window for people of Sephardi descent to seek and get Spanish citizenship. And that's exactly what his son is now doing. He's a uh, And like your grandchildren is thinking about uh, pursuing advanced education in Europe, and there's another window for doing it. Spanish citizenship. Who knew? If you survive it, uh, you may qualify. So it's worth looking into. Irish is the same, but not, not for any reasons related to Judaism. In the case of Spain, apparently it's because of what happened in the 15th century, 16th century. Uh, in Ireland, it's through grandparent dif uh, descent, and Italy is the same. So there's a number of ways you can get European citizenship. And it's a very valuable thing to have. <laughs> Joey, just out of curiosity, you mentioned uh, other relatives who had left Germany when your father had decided not to. Did they actually get to the US, and did you have family when you were growing up, or a larger family, or was it just you, your mother, and your brother? Well, they, first of all, they sent us care packages uh, after the war, which were, was essential for us to um, occasionally have some little bit extras. They had cigarettes in, a, with cigarettes in the packages that could be traded for almost anything under the sun. And uh, uh, foodstuffs and chocolate and uh, chocolate pudding, which my mother burnt, I never forgave her. <laughs> um, and then we came here, and for the first year that we were here, we lived with them in a small apartment in Washington Heights before we could set up ourselves. So, um, so the survivors and the ones that come before us helped us uh, vitally with. Uh, uh, our ability to get a foothold and toehold in this country. Yeah. Is somebody back there? Back there. <laughs> uh, <yeah. clears throat> I've read that there are laws in Germany against uh, anti Semitic remarks, so that there is evidently a need to legislate against discrimination, which strikes me as uh, yeah. suggesting that Germany may not have moved so far if you've got to legislate against it. You know, when they have neo-Nazi movements um, uh, and parades, uh, I witnessed one when I was in uh, Regensburg, um, you know, so that there are people who have different opinions everywhere. Bert, uh, in John Gunther's yeah. book, half the Germans uh, after the Second War, after they lost, still supported Hitler. Joe, this it has been a wonderful, a wonderful talk from you. This is just a nosy question I have. When you travel, what passport do you travel? <laughs> I, have, I have three passports. One is my own personal American passport, 
I have an official passport as a NIH staff, and then I recently have a German passport. Um, I've used my normal, regular passport all the time. I'm afraid to use the official passport <laughs> if we get hijacked. I don't want to be known as a member of the government of the United States uh, who was specially kidnapped. <laughs> I've not used my German passport. I mean, I, um, it just doesn't seem quite right. <laughs> well, if there are no more comments, I thank you very much. I thank you. I think, Bert. I would just say thank you to Joe and thank you to um, Mia, Mears, Monty, and Matthew for trying to come in today. And we appreciate uh, their uh, participation, however it was. <laughs> yeah, but this was wonderful. Thank you, Joe.